So, um, welcome all to this um, SIB Virtual Computational uh, Biology Seminar Series. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to host here at the ETH uh, two speakers, uh, Chandra Sekar, uh, Rama Krishnan, and uh, Michel Okonievski from the uh, Scientific IT Services uh, of the ETH Zurich and the CIB. And I also want to welcome all of you uh, who are uh, at the moment online. So um, I will go briefly through um, the bio of our two speakers. So uh, Seka studied mathematics at the University of California uh, in Berkeley, uh, where he obtained his uh, bachelor in 97. And uh, he also studied computer science and art uh, at the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, where he obtained uh, a master in 2003. Uh, he worked as a software uh, developer and consultant for companies and research in institutions in the U.S. and uh, in Germany. And since 2009, he has been um, at ETH Zurich supporting researchers with software, software for data management, analysis, and visualization. Uh, Michel studied computer science at the uh, Warsaw University in Poland, uh, the Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, where he obtained his PhD in 2002. Uh, he worked in a number of uh, consulting IT projects in the industry and for the uh, United Nations. He then switched to bioinformatics in 2003, doing a postdoc at the University of Antwerp in Belgium and then at the Cancer Research UK in Man Manchester. Uh, in 2008, he started working as a, a bioinformatics expert for the Functional Genomic Center Zurich, and in 2014, uh, at the Scientific IT Services here at the ETH uh, Zurich. So um, I will just briefly go to uh, the, what does the group. So the Scientific IT Services, also called SIS, uh, is led by Bernd Rien. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary bioinformatics and scientific IT support group which develops uh, computational tools. These tools range from lab databases to reusable framework components that enable and support both uh, data analysis and data management in life science research and beyond. The group collaborates with Swiss and European research groups and industry in the life science sector. And the group improves and ports uh, scientific software, develops data management solutions and provides associated services. The group member also integrate and operate data analysis pipelines and provide training and consulting in databases, scientific software development, high performance, and cloud computing. So today we have uh, um, the pleasure to have Seka and Mich uh, Michel that will tell us about Expose, which is a suite of tools uh, for visualization and publishing of single cell RNA seq data. Uh, so, uh, Michel and Seka, uh, thank you again for accepting this invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. Welcome, everyone. So, the outline of the talk is as follows I will do a short introduction to publishing of genomic data. In particular, I will talk about SRA upload and data retrieval. Then we switch for a moment to the hot topic of single cell RNA sequencing and the data analysis of it. This will lead us to the design principles of, of our system. Then we switch to SECAR for the, for the live demo of Expose. Sekar will also discuss more in detail technical aspects of the, of the web GUI. Then we talk about the possibilities of customization and, and future work. So <clears throat> all the people who generate experiments that include sequencing data are supposed to know that when publishing a paper with this data, one needs to make the data set public. Yeah, the goal is to, to allow for reproducible research, to allow other people repeat the data analysis. That's why all the data should be deposited in the public repositories. Here you have logos of all these repositories. Many of these major repositories exchange information or, or do mirroring of each other. Yeah. So, Typically, what is deposited are the fast-Q reads, alternatively BAM alignments. This is what 
th those are the raw data that are expected to be to be published. Uh, the data needs to be properly annotated with metadata, then uploaded to the to the storage of the repository. Then the goal for the biological paper is to get the identifier, like here in the example. So this this paper by Sun et al. They deposited the data in the European Genome Phenome Archive got this accession number and with this accession number you you will be pointed to the from the paper to the data so let's have a quick look on how it is done on the example of short read archive so when you deposit the data you have to enter the information about the biological project about the samples uh, about the people who generated those data and this is done in a, in a form of a wizard it's pretty convenient, still there, there, there are some smaller tricks. So once the, the, the project is submitted, then you, you have the navigation web interface so you can see your uh, samples, projects, uh, and other aspects of the, of the uploaded data. So once the metadata are entered, then you can also uh, then you should upload your real data. This can be done with FTP upload, with the Aspera plugin, and then you can, you can see like finished project. And this project can have the release date, which is arbitrarily selected, or you can decide to release your data, for example, exactly when the paper is published. Yeah? So this is the typical policy. Your data is kept private or yeah, not 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 released to the public until until a given date. That's that's normal normal feature of it. So then the data get into the into the repository and it can be downloaded. The metadata can be browsed, for example, with, with the SRA run selector. Here you have, the, for example, the description of the experimental description of this particular RNA-seq experiment. Yeah? You can see single samples, you can, you can filter, you can choose your samples. To download the, the data, uh, the trick is that SRA, for example, uses a proprietary compressed format for, for storing the data, so namely SRA format. Then you have to use SRA toolkit, which is, which is a set of tools used to operate on, on these archives, mainly to, to unpack it back into, into FastQ. There is also a number of, of other utility tools. So for example, there is SRA DB library in R, which is mainly fetching the SQLite database of all the SRA experiments. So the structure is like, like, like here in these five tables. And then once you have this SQLite database on your computer, you can query it about the, the metadata of the experiment, and then you can download from the from the R level the, the SRA archives. So let's switch to the to the story of single cell RNA sequencing, which is, as I said, sort of a hot topic in the in the in the genome gene expression uh, techniques. Yeah. So we th there is now a number of uh, machines and library prep techniques for the for the next generation sequences sequencing that can be used to read the expression level from very small number of cells. Yeah, it's uh, single cell. It's just a, it's just a buzzword. Typically, there are at least uh, several cells, and then <clears throat> RNA is extracted. Then, like in other library prep techniques, this RNA is encoded into cDNA, then it's amplified, then it's packaged into the sequencing library, then it's sequenced typically on, on Illumina. Then for each single cell, you have the expression profile. 
and then this can be analyzed and used in a, in a feedback loop for, for the further experiments. So that's the, the, the very general outline. But those single cell experiments are really done right now. They are popping up. One of them was the main motivation for our adaptation of the exposed system for visualization. So the analysis of single cell data, it's mostly done, especially on the level of the primary analysis, like the standard analysis of RNA-seq. So here you see the, the typical jungle of software and formats that is used for RNA-seq sequencing analysis. Uh, so for basically for single cell and RNA-seq, it's done in the same way. It's the alignment, feature counting, and then creating the count table. Yeah, and then, then you can also try to, to see splicing and, and similar events. The problem is that secondary analysis, so statistical methods, are mostly not developed yet. The biostatistical groups are working on it. Like I know that locally, the Mark Robinson group from Uni Zurich, they are for sure doing the research of, on appropriate methods for, for single cell RNA-seq. But it's not there yet. Still, there is a number of tools. Uh, like in the bioconductor, bioconductor repository or, or their courses, which you can use for analysis of your data. Mainly now it is the level of, of quality control on looking generally in the data. Then you look deeper into, into the profile of, of specific cells and specific genes. Yeah, so from the, from the tutorial of, of Lund, McCarthy, Marioni, you can see yeah, histograms, density plots, violin plots. Here in the, in the Cambridge tutorial, there is a bit more insight if you, if you would like to read more. So the data analysis challenges of single cell RNA-seq uh, come mostly from the fact that the number of samples, so number of cell sequence is much bigger than in the, in the standard RNA-seq experiment. Standard RNA-seq experiment, it's typically several samples, sometimes more. Yeah? Typical single cell experiment can go into hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of cells. Yeah? So the count table has more columns. And as the coverage from the cells is lower, the count table is more sparse, has more zeros. So it has different, different distributions, yeah? So as I said, there are no established guidelines on, 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 the, on the secondary analysis. Sometimes there is a need of comparison and linking to standard RNA-seq. We, we have such a case in, 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 our, in our project. So one of the tricks is also that with that big amount of, of cells, there is no polite economical way of rerunning the primary analysis. Yeah? If the single cell experiment is deposited in, for example, in SRA, downloading the data, running the alignment and counting takes a lot of time and takes a lot of expertise, we can say that you would need a dedicated bioinformatics postdoc for, for a couple of months to do it properly because they, this, okay, this, this can be standardized, but always there are, there, are, there are different aspects and this is a lot of data grinding, yeah, which has to be done on, on some kind of a cluster. So, you cannot expect your public viewers, public users to rerun fully the, the analysis. That's why we, in, this, in the discussion with, with Verdon Tyler and the, the lab members of the group of Dagmar Rieber, we have discussed and, and written down the user interface design assumption for a system which will be used to visualize and publish the results. So the data after the primary analysis, the, the expression level. 
So yeah, we want to publish the already pre-prepared data, mapped and counted. So this 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 level can be can be skipped. So just we work on the expression tables and, and annotation files. Also, the goal will be to give the end user sort of interactive way of playing with these results, yeah? Like like in a various ad hoc visualization. So in that way, we avoid rerunning primary analysis and save time and, and computational resources. And hopefully we can do it without the bioinformatician expert for primary analysis. Uh, in this particular project, as I said, we have both single cell and classic RNA-seq population samples. The need of the, of the users would be to select specific genes, to select specific cells, samples in the population, specific conditions. Uh, the interface obviously almost needs to be web-based, needs to be efficient and responsive. Yeah? And the main, main feature needed would be like interactive drilling down in the data to see the local patterns of expression. So those are the uh, assumptions. Those are the input data. So we have the count table for the cells, yeah, which is, as I said, more sparse. Okay, th those are just yeah, example data. They are not, not the real, one, real ones. In parallel, you have the standard RNA seq samples. And then there is the sample annotation, which includes in that project cell type and time point. The, the treatment is also made up here. So those four tables are the input tables for the, for the system. As a model app, we've seen the nice example of done by collaboration from, of, of the groups of Basel and Geneva, I think, which has done a bunch of violin plots and other types of visualizations done in, from R in, in Shiny yeah? for, for a particular data set, for a particular yeah, nature uh, science paper. So it works nicely, but we had concerns that when we choose the technology that shiny and R, R is known not to be too, fa to, to be too fast. Yeah? So it, shiny in general is a framework for building, for fast building nice web data driven apps from the level of R. So typically R developers can do a shiny app in a, in a few mouse clicks. Yeah, but the, the possible drawback is the performance and the scalability with the number of users. So we use Shiny, but mainly for prototyping. Yeah. Then we discussed with, with Sekar, and this is the point where I switch to Sekar, and he will tell more about the, the framework that, that we use. Okay, hello, I'm Shaker. Can everyone hear me? Is it okay? Yeah, all right, great. Um, so, uh, whereas uh, Misha was a, more of a bioinformatician, I'm more of a software developer and data visualization uh, person. So, I came to the project from a different perspective. Um, and so, the tools that we use in our group um, are much more uh, around general purpose programming languages and general purpose architecture. So we do a lot of work with HTML, we do a lot of work with Python, we do a lot of work with Java. Um, and uh, nowadays, especially with uh, these frameworks like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, um, Python is a really viable environment for doing data analysis and data manipulation because you have the, op uh, the ability to take advantage of the fast uh, matrix operations and you have the data frame model that comes from R, which makes it very convenient to work with and manipulate data. Um, and then uh, we also, um, use use tools like component architectures like React for um, constructing user interfaces, and we use uh, libraries like D3 for building visualizations, interactive visualizations. Um, and 
admittedly, these tools require a greater amount of knowledge, but they also, I think, offer the potential for um, efficient UIs that are fast, scalable, and allow a great deal of interaction. And I guess most importantly in the context of this project, they're, they're tools that we're familiar with. Um, so the, the background behind how we came to choose these tools requires taking a step back um, kind of before this particular realization of uh, the project. So th the term expose and the background behind the, what we've done in the NeurasMX project um, dates back to an earlier project that was done with the plant uh, biology lab of uh, the Grissom at uh, Eteha. And uh, a postdoc and a staff member, Önder and uh, Matthias, came to us with a proposal for a piece of software that they wanted to have. And this was an application for um, kind of biology-aware uh, exploratory data analysis. Um, they, they kind of uh, phrased it as, as like somewhere between R and um, tools like Tableau or Spotfire. So the reason they uh, had that designation was that you, you have tools like R, which are very, very powerful very, and allow you to do all sorts of analysis and all sorts of visualizations. But in order to use them, you need to be a programmer. Um, and then on the other hand, there's these tools like Spotfire that make it possible to build visualizations, but they, they, they tend to be very general and have um, no or very minimal understanding of, of biology and the kind of visualizations that are necessary and useful in biology. So they wanted to come up with a, um, like an environment which allowed users to build their own uh, applications for data visualization and exploratory data analysis by picking from a library of components and constructing a UI and um, specifying interactions and how these particular components in interact with another, one another and then allowing them to just point that at some data and then go crazy with their um, analysis and exploration of the data. Um, it's obviously a very ambitious idea that they had, and they had funding for a pilot project, which we then implemented, and I think I've got that in the next slide here, right, um, it, as this kind of um, application that you hear, you see here in the slide. So we built a few different components that were drawn from the kinds of data that they used or utilized existing tools that were out there. So we didn't build our own genome browser, we used the um, JavaScript genome browser that uh, um, I think was developed at Sanger Institution. And on the other hand, we also, on the, on the um, let's see here, on the, on the right-hand side of the, of, of the slide, you also see a visualization that comes from KEG, where, again, we weren't generating that. We were just pointing um, the user to that uh, as an appropriate interaction for a particular kind of drill down operation with the data. So the idea was to take advantage of things that were already out there to the greatest extent possible, but um, uh, make it possible also to customize the, the UI and the interaction to a particular uh, kind of data or a project. And so this is the building, the foundation that we used um, to build NeurostimX, because although Expose is currently on hold due to looking for funding, um, we think the architecture is very good and we want, and, and we thought it was a very natural fit for the kind of interface that the Taylor group and the Eber um, groups were asking for, for, for visualizing their data from the NeurostimX project. So, um, the architecture is taken from Expose, where we have a bunch of objects that are made available, components that are made available to the UI, and these are all React components, um, which allows us to uh, combine components uh, largely arbitrarily and define very general interactions between them. Um, but at the same time, the individual things that are wrapped in the component can be very specific they can be custom built D3 visualizations like the one you see for the gene ontology histogram on the right hand side, or they can be reusing tools that were developed elsewhere, like the Inchlib um, heat map, uh, interactive heat map, which was developed at a chem informatics group in the Czech Republic. Um, and f it also allows us to combine kind of uh, underlying technologies very. Uh, 
problem specific in problem specific way. So Intralib is built on top of Canvas, which is necessary for the performance that it delivers. Um, and in the D3 visualization, we use SVG because it's a very convenient underlying model for doing these kinds of visualizations. Um, I think now I can maybe show a, a, a brief demo of um, the app that we built for uh, interacting with the neurostomics data. So this is the, the page that you come in to when you initially navigate here. So it just gives you some general information about the data. So um, as Michel explained, in, in Neurostem X, they um, conducted two different types of measurements on um, mice stem cells to understand how uh, the neurons develop. So one kind of measurement was based on single cell data, and um, they did uh, expression analysis for the entire um, genome uh, using single cell kind of samples. And on the other hand, they did the same sort of analysis, but with population data. And the goal of the project is to compare and try to spot discrepancies between the activity that happens at the single cell level versus the population level. Because um, the hypothesis is that there's actually a, a much greater level of differentiation at the single cell level than you might necessarily see at the population level. So that's something they wanted to explore and better understand. And this UI is designed to make it possible to interact with both of these um, kinds of uh, modes of, of, of data acquisition in a way that combines them and, and makes it possible to, to um, do analysis and navigate from one uh, type of data to another. Um, so as you can see here also, the, the, uh, the way they acquired data was done, um, it, it's parallel regardless of the kind of measurement that they're doing. So in the single cell data, there's four different uh, cell types that they analyzed because the, the, the um, stem cells kind of have some sub-differentiation that occurs during their development. Um, and they analyzed, in both cases, 10 different time points in the development series. And you see here, these are the num this is the, 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 the genome that was the number of genes that are um, um, were analyzed, and you see that the, um, there's data for a slightly higher number of genes at the population level versus the single cell, uh, which makes sense because you can probably pick up fainter signals when you're doing analysis on population level data. Um, so this is just, this is just the initial page that allows you to kind of get an overview of the data. Um, there's two ways of entering uh, the actual data exploration. So one way is this explore tab. The idea here is you don't necessarily have any preconceived notions of what you're looking at. You just want to see what the data um, shows. So at the, for this, we do a clustering analysis. This is, again, this is very generic. It has, it's not necessarily biology specific, um, but we do a clustering both on the different cell types and all of the genes. The genes are displayed in the rows, and um, the different cell types and time points are displayed in the, in the columns. Um, this is the Inchlib interactive heat map. You can kind of click around in here. We on the fly compute a gene ontology analysis so that you can try to understand what genes are in that row because um, each row at this level of the heat map contain, can contain a, multi, a large number of genes because we've kind of collapsed genes that are um, that, that, just, that cluster together into one row to make it possible to navigate the um, 30,000 genes um, within just one UI. If we were to display 30,000 rows, that would quickly become unwieldy. But we've, we've collapsed that to a more reasonable number of rows to um, uh, support better navigation. And you can see here, so the row that I clicked, that's the one that's highlighted in green. Um, the gene ontology analysis kind of tells you uh, a high level um, understanding of what kind of genes are in there. So apparently have something to do with the cytosolic small ribosomal subunit and ribosomes in general. Um, once you've selected um, some, th that, what that operation does is it selects some genes to look at. So then you can navigate over to the inspect page 
um, and kind of look at those genes in greater detail. It's of course also possible to go directly to this page. In particular, if you have, you know, your genes that you're interested in, some, let's say you have like 20 genes or something like that that you, that you um, like or you, you study, you can go directly to this page and input those genes right into here um, without that step of doing the exploration in order to find the genes that you think are interesting. But uh, because I, I don't know anything about mouse biology, I usually go through the explore page because um, it helps me find things that that I can uh, then look at. So what you see here are there's a, um, a, a matrix of checkboxes that allow you to focus in on particular cell types and time points if you're interested in doing that. Below that you see the same heat map visualization but here each row is one gene so it's down at the gene level and you see um, displayed next to one another the population data versus the single cell data, which makes it possible to look for and spot differences here. As you can see, the population data is much more homogeneous, where, so whereas the single cell data, there's a much, much greater variation in terms of the expression profiles for um, the individual genes at different time points. So if we take something like, uh, what is this, TPT1, PS6, at the population data, it's highly expressed everywhere. And then if you look at it here in the single cell data, it's still highly expressed at some of the um, cell type time points, but at some of them, it's not so highly expressed. And uh, that might be something that you want to kind of look at in detail. By going further down this page, you can see the act, like the expression values in greater detail shown as box and whisker plots that are interactive. Let's go down to our friend TPT, uh, whatever that was, PS6, right? So you see here, um, these are the box plots of the um, expression level data on the population measurements versus in the single cell measurements. So you can see here immediately that there's much greater variation, um, but this is also an interactive element because one of the things they want to do is to drill down to these things that are outliers, these cells um, samples that are outliers and try to understand what's going on within those cells. And so by clicking on one of these outliers, I can, I go to like a sample detail page, which shows me data for just that sample, um, zoomed in on the genes that I've selected. It sometimes takes a couple of seconds to compute, but then it comes up. So what we see now here are box and whisker plots of, um, all of the genes that I've selected and at, drawn as a dot is that individual sample every, where, where it appears on all of these genes. Um, because one of the things that, that you, might wanna, you might ask yourself is, why is this sample an outlier? Is it because maybe there's some measurement like screw up and maybe there's just some, it's just dirty data? Or is, it, is there something that's really happening at the biological level um, that caused this sample to be an outlier. And so, for example, the fact that this sample on, on many genes is within the interquartile range, is within kind of the range of normal values, is an indication that, that it's probably not just a measurement um, anomaly that, that this sample is an outlier. So it's clearly an outlier on some of these genes, like uh, GM27684 and GM4735, but it's very much within the normal range, very close to the median, for example, on ATP5B. Um, we, we also take a look at all of the genes for which that sample is an outlier and do the gene ontology analysis on that in order to see if there's some particular categories of genes that pop up that might give the biologists some ideas to what's going on, why that it's, why is that an outlier? Is there some particular aspect of how, of the biology of that gene that, that's causing that that um, sample to be an outlier. Um, so this is generally a very large, yeah, it's often a very large uh, plot, but this is an analysis that we do on the fly and then we show, um, we, we show this, this here. Um, it's also possible to just go into the detail for any individual gene and just see the values for, for, for that one gene if you're not interested in looking at a whole bunch of genes, but one. and we give you several different views into that data simultaneously. So you can compare the population versus the single cell data, but we also give you 
box plots here that are done at the cell type um, level. So we, we show the single cell data versus the population data right next to each other um, in box plots that are drawn uh, next to each other. To make it easier to compare the data in, in a bunch of different ways, depending on what is most appropriate for the kind of analysis that you're doing at the moment. Um, so let me go back here. So I think I should probably hand it the uh, <laughs> floor back to Michelle. So I'm going to do that. Bear with me for a sec. Yeah, so we are going towards concluding our talk. So as Sekar has demonstrated, with Expose interface, it is possible to publish your data in the way that you can look at this data interactively. The raw data still needs to be published in SRA or similar repository, but such an user interface, web user interface, can be published as parallel. in parallel. It has several advantages. So the first advantage is that you can give this interface to play for, the, for reviewers of your paper to play. Yeah? So these people should look into your work yeah, in a bit nicer way because they, yeah, if the, 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 first, the first problem, if I'm a reviewer of a, of a genomics paper, and if, if I can't reproduce the story which, which is described, this is yeah, a bit disturbing. And here, assuming that this interface works smoothly, makes your reviewer happy. Uh, then, after the paper is published, the same story about the end users. Yeah? End users can come, enter their favorite genes, or the whole, as, as Sekar was showing, the whole genomic signatures, so set of genes, and see how they behave on your, on your samples and cells. And it's going on pretty much live, fast, and interactively. So <clears throat> our group, Scientific IT Services, can customize expose in, in several ways. So we, we have shown these two flavors for agronomics microarrays and single cell RNA seq. Still we plan to do it as out of the box application template. So the goal would be that yeah the, the biologists come with, with their count data and and annotation data, they enter it into the into the system and they get the live web application that can be published. Yeah. Mm, also, it is not much work now for, for our development team to adapt to various types of new data or, or, or various flavors of the, of, the, of the data after the primary analysis. Yeah. So, yeah, the, anyway, the message is that the system can be customized depending on the data set or, or, the, or the biological purpose of the, of the publication. So, yeah, you are welcome to, to contact us. Uh, we are open for discussion. That's, that's our website, SISID at uh, Yeah, okay, the, the summary of our activities Diana did in the beginning. Uh, our flagship system is also the open beast for life science data management. Uh, we do trainings, code clinics, we maintain quite big cluster. Uh, we do various types of, of training and consulting as well. So yeah, we are open for discussion on various types of projects. And we would like to conclude by, by expressing thanks to, to people who collaborated with us on, on that project. So within scientific IT services, yeah, it's our boss, Bernd Rien. The person who did a lot of work on that is also Sven. Uh, the Expose project, original Expose project, as Sekar said, was developed in the, in the collaboration with the, with the Grusem lab. The expose on single cell data 
was done after, under the guide, uh, guidelines of, of from Verdon Tyler and from people from Iberlab, especially Zara and Marcelo were the people who has driven the development with, with their requirements, tests, and generally not nice collaborations. So yeah, there is the email to, to, to Verdon Tyler because he's the person, he said that he can be contacted also for the biological and methodological con content of this particular experiment. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes the talk.